If you were aboard a cargo ship taken over by dozens of violent fugitives who accidentally unleashed an experimental human monster, what would you do? Transporting criminals is a stupidly dangerous task, no matter what train, plane, or automobile you spring for. Space is tight, adrenaline is high, and every single one of them wants to make your job a living hell. Oh, yeah, and they're all prone to murdering anyone who gets in their way. Now, contain that clusterfuck to a ship in the middle of the ocean during a storm, and you're looking at the longest three days of your life, trapped with a bunch of the dumbest cops imaginable and zero backup to save you when some sort of monster is awakened in the cargo hold. We're told these 20 police officers are some of South Korea's finest, each having more than 10 years on the force behind them before volunteering for this assignment. But it won't take long to question question those credentials and realize that these little piggies are locked in here with the fugitives, not the other way around. This guy's done with this shit before the trip even starts. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the human flesh ripper in Project Wolf Hunting. Back in 2017, South Korea tried to extradite 47 criminals from the Philippines via plane and, well... <laughs> Ah, yes. The noble and super moral revenge suicide bomber taking out the man who killed your family, plus an entire city block worth of innocent people. Look, I'm all for revenge killing. I think it does solve problems, but show a little discretion. Dude killed seven police officers and grievously injured 30 innocent travelers. Killing innocent people in the process just makes you the asshole. Cut to five years later, and they're getting ready for their second extradition trip from the Philippines to Busan. God damn. Busan is like the Asian Bermuda Triangle of disasters. To avoid another revenge mass killing, they've opted for a cargo ship this time. You know, a totally controllable, much slower form of transportation that is eight times as long as an Olympic swimming pool and can average 400,000 square feet with a large foreign crew you can't properly vet beforehand. Throw in a million blind corners and hiding places, a communication system that can be completely disabled with an axe and an engine room so large and confusing they need an actual map to find their way through it. And you've got yourself an even crazier spinoff to Con Air. A cargo ship is a mode of transportation never designed to move prisoners that is also impossible to secure beforehand and recover after south. When I say this is the worst choice that they could have picked for this assignment, I mean it. Not just because of everything I've just said, but because they didn't need to change the original plan. The only problem they had with transporting prisoners by plane was letting people crowd the prisoners' walk of shame through the terminal. The Ridge is a super slim pocket wallet for the modern man. I too was once an uncivilized drudge hiding my meager shillings in a flap of cow's taint. It was the early 2000s. We didn't know any better. We didn't have any better. Times have changed though. The future is now and the Ridge has perfected the engineering solution for a strong, durable, efficient means of bearing the fruits of your labor, be it paper or plastic or both. Made out of titanium, weighing only two ounces, which is like four pencils, and merely six millimeters thick, which is basically really thin. You won't feel this thing bouncing around in your pants, so nothing out of the ordinary for you. Check out this completely unbiased wallet comparison slider. Look how fat and grotesque that pig's perineum is. It can't even stay closed with zero cards in it. <laughs> At 10 cards, it's categorically gaped. Now, the ridge, on the other hand, is roughly an eighth of the thickness, even with a 10 stack lodged in its tight frame. What a piece of wallet. This butte is powder coated in Matt's base camp orange, looking like you're about to ascend Everest by paying all the Sherpas to carry your ass to the top. Also, check out the Ridge key case. These stealthy cases can secure two to six keys with their patent pending tension system, locking your keys in between two premium metal plates. Join the first world by going to theridgewallet.com slash nerdexplains and picking yourself up a wallet worth the money it's carrying. Use my code nerdexplains and get 10% off where some crazed victim could turn it into the red carpet. Another plane would have worked just fine if... <sighs> 
I don't know. They'd gone the painfully obvious route of closing down and using a private airfield to avoid a crowd of potential bombers and conduct this extradition in secrecy. Instead, their change of transportation is leaked to the press before they even leave. I thought this was classified. Why is it on the god? Ugh, unless this was a big brain diversion with dummy prisoners, which I'm guessing it's not, you guys seriously need to get your OPSEC under control. 20 fugitives step off a bus in the shipping yard and get their first taste of the three-day journey ahead of them, courtesy of Captain Agro here and his 19 fellow officers. I am mother... This group is just comboing red flags. Why would you ever hire guards and detectives with emotional vendettas against the prisoners for a trip like this? It's like letting bulls into a china shop, except that china shop can sink, and it's full of poor helpless crew members who literally just want to drive the boat. Unbeknownst to any of them, the team monitoring their trip in Busan has been replaced last minute by a new special forces team led by Captain O, an SOB so smug, we already know we're gonna see him again later. Pairs of male prisoners are handcuffed to railings in separate rooms along a single short corridor on F1, while the sole two female prisoners get first-class accommodations in the ship's chapel slash peep show room two floors up on A1. Don't let them out of your sight. Sure thing, boss. I bet that'll be no problem whatsoever. It shouldn't be, considering you've sequestered everyone in a hallway that is all of 20 feet long. With 18 male captives, spread across nine rooms, watching these fools should be the easiest job your men have ever had. Four hour shifts, 10 men each, standing back to back down the hallway facing the cells so they can literally just keep their eyes on the two killers under their guard at all times. You even tell them not to let them out of their sight. So why is everyone facing away from their criminals? I mean, for fun sake, they are chaining prisoners with dozens of counts of murders each to random screwed in pipes, railings, and radiators with no actual solid door securing these supposed cells. And these pit poor conditions, at the very least, their hands should be handcuffed high up behind their backs so they don't have enough freedom to motion their hands to pick locks with, say, with hidden paper clips they spitch or scratch out of their orifices. <laughs> opens whirls around with a hmm. Way to avoid prison, only to end up locked in your own body with tetanus. Dinner service begins, and our ship heads for open water. Only 1,741 nautical miles to go before we reach land again. Apparently, half the police have already to other parts of the ship because it's the guys who cooked dinner who were also serving it. Team 1 couldn't overlap this shift by 10 minutes to prevent sneaky crewman number 1 over here from cutting through the lock on this chain link fence. Oh, I see. Busan sent its E squad for this mission. E for expendable officers. The ones a step above mall security. Meanwhile, the mission's replacement doctor navigates the engine room maze to the makeshift laboratory currently holding Deadpool. I mean, currently holding some deep fried ass with maggots in his mouth and his eyes stapled shut that needs to be kept in a rebar cage. Can, can we just pause for a second? What the f*** is this? Why the f*** is there a creepy half-dead Deadpool in the cargo hold of this ship with a couple randos who definitely aren't with the cops? How did they get a last-minute doctor to agree to help with this? Why did none of the crew on this ship warn the cops that there's an entire hidden section of this engine room? Why was none of this secured beforehand? Oh, that's right, because they're on a giant cargo ship. The doctor's been hired to administer sedatives along the trip. Too bad nobody aboard this boat is good at their job. This shot isn't going to do sh and neither is this cage with convenient arm-sized holes for this mutant to take advantage of. He's not even shackled. Not that handcuffs would do much, as we'll see in a little bit. Oh no, don't let the monster get loose. This is a cargo ship. It can carry well over 100,000 tons in weight, so why isn't this crispy mother in a chromium cell wrapped inside a tungsten cell wrapped inside a carbon steel shell reinforced with unobtainium? Dim the lights, pump in some halothane anesthetic gas and oxygen to keep the big guy alive, and some midazolam and droperidol to nerf his aggression. Don't assume the leopards will never eat your face. Keep them high as a kite, locked away in a vault so they can't. Back upstairs, the cops have started copping, falling asleep at their post, talking sh 
each other and playing cards. While the crew sneaks around preparing for the inevitable mutiny this peacock punk is about to incite. The crew gears up with guns hidden in the freezer. Peacock gets his cuffs off and sh kicks off and the cops finally notice one of the crew is packing an AK. The melee begins and it is a bloodbath, a crimson shower of red wedding proportions. The crew ringleader uses a high pressure air gun to kill two cops in seconds. These cops pop like wine gushers. The crew stacks the bodies in the freezer and heads to the bridge to up their kill count. Not this stuff. Yeah, who even needs the crew to steer the boat? practically steer themselves these days. This definitely wasn't a bad idea. Lou pops the emergency axe and takes out the ship's entire tracking and communication system to the mainland with a couple swings. Dayeon goes in search of a signal when the radio stop working. Busan starts losing its sh- Let me get this right. You knew those inmates would raise hell- but yet you still went through with this dumb plan and didn't have any contingency plans or QRFs. Who the f even is this super special command force anyways? Aren't the police supposed to keep criminals under control? What the f What are my taxes for? Bro, you are literally doing jack too. Down on F1, Peacock Punk's Selly makes a noise. One of the only four cops left in charge down here gets Mike Tyson when he comes to investigate. I bet he wishes he'd gone with my two shift 10 men each plan right about now. The kill happy crew arrives in time to relieve the other three detectives of their innards and free the rest of the fugitives. Up on deck, five cops finally wake from their stupors long enough to realize choosing a cargo ship was an absolutely sh for Brain's bad idea. They converge on the bridge, only to reveal no one can shoot at all. Not even in a space the size of a public bathroom. No one except Peacock downstairs, who strips a corpse of its pistol and kills one of his own guys for fun, discarding the gun because who needs one of those when you still have to kill another dozen cops? <laughs> God damn. If I'm last cop standing here, I'm dropping my badge on the floor and walking right out the door to that life raft. Early retirement effective immediately. God. And this cop, she either can't aim for sh or she's avoiding taking every kill shot she's offered. Either way, a straight up liability in a situation like this. Dayeon asks the first mate if there's any other way to contact the mainland, but the only part of the ship with that capability is in the engine room, where the mutant is just waking up from his thousand year slumber to blood drops falling on his head. See, these armholes are way too big. He can take his own oxygen mask off and everything. Nearby, Peacock starts knifing engine room engineers and sends two goons to destroy the engine, something you'd only want to do if you were planning on being spirited off the ship by reinforcements. What the f*** is going on? This is peak stupidity, and also confusing as is Peacock just an agent of pure chaos, or does he actually want to escape with his gang? If it's the latter, he needs to use one of his lackeys to lure cops into a low ground area, where they have a clear line of sight from the high ground and can finish them off. Then, when they own this ship, they should navigate the ship to within easy distance of a country with no extradition treaty with South Korea, like Taiwan, Papua New Guinea, or Myanmar. Taiwan is definitely closest along this route, but then again, you need a functioning engine, and you need to be able to steer the ship. Oops. Now, if you didn't destroy the engine and the crew, you could get with inside of Taiwan, get on the two life rafts usually aboard most commercial cargo ships, and evacuate. And if that was your plan, you might want to send some goons to secure the lifeboats so the cops don't take them. Here I am, doing all this thinking. Why am I talking about the survival of the gang members anyways, you ask? Well, because the cops immediately go and do something so absolutely bonkers idiotic that they kind of deserve what's coming to them. Let me preface. I understand they can't abandon their posts. It would be easy to gather survivors, take those two life rafts, and drift away from all of this before calling for reinforcements. But... They're the good guys, and they have to do the right thing, even if it's absolutely mental. But there is no excuse for willingly giving up the high ground when they reach the engine maze, getting separated and surrounded by thugs almost immediately, and dying blood gushing deaths. None of this has to happen. I repeat, none of this is necessary to secure the ship and the criminals. Instead of announcing their presence, the cops should have slipped back upstairs and closed the engine room bulkheads. Engine room late 
layouts vary from ship to ship, but they're usually compartmentalized in case of flooding or fire. This means they need to secure several doors to seal the criminals in completely, but that is a much easier task than taking on eight at once like this dip tries to, or letting a murderer get within gun grabbing range. The criminals have just said they're going to destroy the engine. Fine, let them. Just seal them in with it. Their prisoner transport was just on the news this morning. The cops know they're being monitored from Korea. Backup will arrive. And while the criminals could try to blow up the engine or tear a hole in the hole while they're waiting for reinforcements, it would doom them as well. So why not take the risk? Suddenly, a new boss enters the game. It's the mutant from the makeshift lab, already soaked in blood from killing off his keepers. He crushes a man's chest, shooting him back 50 feet into the wall and stopping the fight cold. He advances. With each step, his bare feet slam into the metal floor with the sound and weight of a T-Rex. Dude is much heavier than he looks. Whatever experiments were done on him, his punches and kicks pack the force of a freight train. And he has predator thermal vision. So mark down another fail for the psychopath that did a poor job stapling his eyes shut. Hidden in these gory clues is the answer on how to stop him from killing us all. But we'll get back to that in a bit. <laughs> So this dude rips out his ribcage with his bare hand. What are the rest of you still doing there? Run! Or better yet, back quietly away from the beast. He hesitates for a solid beat like he's absorbing what he sees around him. Almost like a predator. The cops and criminals suddenly find themselves on the same side as the mutant tears through the ranks. When one guy tries to flee, this beast tears off the guy's skull and then caves his chest in. Peacock gains the high ground and empties his automatic weapon, killing everyone except the juggernaut. He tries again with another gun, but instead of waiting for his bro to get out of the way, he lays into his back, which shields the alpha from the hits. Now he's out of ammo and can't escape the mutant's hammer of indiscriminate violence. All that blood short circuits the system and the engine finally dies. But not before the Flesh Ripper wraps his hands around Captain Agro's throat. Half good, half bad guy, Duil steps in to save him, revealing a curious brand seared into the mutant's chest. A look of recognition flashes across Duil's face. The dwindling pool of survivors race for the exit, shooting and finally kicking the monster back as the bulkhead seal. <laughs> This cop avoids two chances at a kill shot. <sighs> Guys, you gonna go close up the other engine room exit? No? Uh oh, I'm sure it'll be fine. Peacock's death and this moment where the Alpha digs the cop's bullet out of his collarbone tells us this guy is not immune to bullets. A few well-placed rounds to the head would have ended this freak show. It's almost funny how many times people in this movie fail to use their guns when being attacked or shoot him in the head when they have the chance. Almost funny, mostly stupid. A surviving prisoner tells everyone that the mutant is wearing an outdated prison uniform from decades ago, but Captain O and Busan knows all about that. Turns out Captain O and the man he works for also bear those brands on their chest and have the same brutal strength as the Flesh Ripper, which they call the Alpha. Captain O's boss tells him to steal a US Navy helicopter, fly with the team to the ship and retrieve the Alpha. Good luck with that. He's warming up by ripping the nurse's throat out and killing crew members who waited too long to run for the lifeboats. <laughs> Dude, there are life jackets everywhere. Just grab one and jump. I know I covered the movie Open Water and it didn't fare so well for those people, but I'm still taking my chances in the ocean over this beast any day. Turns out Alpha is a pharmaceutical experiment gone very wrong or very, very right. He crushes men's heads, takes knife stabs like bug bites, cuts through knees with a single slice, tears out men's hearts, rips off arms. And now he's found a gun. I bet that you US military salivating just thinking about this. Even more when most of the remaining survivors head to the makeshift lab and Dayeon finds a convenient exposition book on the desk. Inside, she learns Alpha was once a captured Japanese soldier in World War II, experimented on as part of the Kimono project and turned into a weapon by splicing predator DNA into his own after subjecting him to a lobotomy. 
Look at all that spotless white PPE when they're operating on a bloody POW in a dank bunker bathroom. Also, why in the fuck would you give a POW superhuman strength without quadrupling his restraints and armed guards? Predictably, he turned on his doctors and the Japanese military officers who slow clapped his torture. <laughs> No, by all means, don't use your guns to shoot the bloody killing machine mowing through you and your friends. Wait, why aren't we watching this guy's story? The file suggests he only reacts to threatening movements and human body temperature, but that file doesn't seem to have been updated since he put a bullet in his doctor's brain back in the 40s. That first one only applies if running away qualifies as a threatening movement, and that second one is a bit vague. Does that mean if we give ourselves a fever, he'll pass us by like the zombies from World War Z? Not likely. And who's volunteering for that trial by suicide? Instead, we need to cool ourselves down. Unfortunately, the average temperature in and around the Philippine Sea in September is over 80 degrees, so going outside isn't going to help us much. Mm, it's too bad the people reading the file aren't the same people who know about the kitchen freezer. Pity. Peacock's crew encountered the Alpha in the woman's holding cell. He kills a chained guard, then turns on the rest. You go. Let's go! Dude, you have him almost at point-blank range. Kill him. The Alpha chases the last of Peacock's crew to the elevator, killing Gunbay. Captain Agro arrives to see the massacre has continued up here. <laughs> Why would you not have your gun drawn at all times at this point? He narrowly poised Myungju to safety before the elevator plummets to the engine room floor. There, now we someone else's problem. Just kidding, cause the Alpha seems to teleport back to their floor within seconds. Captain Agro and Myungju take cover in the kitchen. The captain seals her in the freezer and decides to take on the beast for what reason exactly? This ain't that wooden door in Titanic. There was room for both of you in that meat locker, but at least you bit off his arm arm. Yeah, seems like a great trade. Your life for an arm. Should have stayed in the fridge. The Alpha investigates the freezer, but the criminal plays dead amidst the corpses. He smells her, but lets her live. The body's cooldown rate averages about 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit per hour in cold weather. She's only been in there for two minutes, so there is no way her body is cooled down enough to hide on top of the pile. Burying herself under them or behind them on the floor, under their legs, might provide enough cover to confuse him, but even that would be a long shot. Unfortunately, the people who read his file and know about his thermal vision don't know the bodies are here. If they did, they could have used these meat popsicles as camouflage or their own invisibility cloak. These bodies have been dead in the freezer for at least an hour, probably more like two. Under non-freezing circumstances, they'd need at least a half a day to cool down completely, but they've been flash frozen here. After he lets this chick live, she should be wetting towels and setting them in here to freeze then wrapping those around herself, and then make a break for the life raft. Sure, the rafts are partially smashed, but better some floatsome in the ocean than pressed like grapes under that guy's foot. The Navy helicopter lands on the deck, and Captain O's men descend into the ship. My young Jew finds them first, and takes a bullet to the head with the captain's name on it. The doctor, the old criminal, and Da Yeon appear in front of the firing squad next. Captain O kills her for failing her job. Duil gets Captain O in his sight, revealing he too was an experiment like the Alpha. Is everyone a super mutant now? Where can I sign up for this later generation of serum Captain O and Duil got? And wait a second, why exactly does Aeon Genetics want this Alpha? Super strength, anti-aging, they've clearly perfected their serum with Duil and Captain O. Maybe they really want that sweet, sweet predator vision, which does seem pretty tight, if you don't have to get your eyeballs stapled shut. We learn Duil's responsible for the Alpha being aboard the ship. He wanted the Alpha to lead him to the men like Captain O, who experimented on him and killed his family. He's been letting this thing run loose the entire time. They were in it together. The Alpha interrupts story time. They pick off the guards one by one until Captain O is finally able to take down the Alpha by disabling his other arm, slicing through the artery in his ankle, and finally slitting his throat. Convenient that he forgot he's been killing most things in here with his legs. Captain O and Duil have themselves a knife fight on the ship's deck. Papa, Papa, that's how your kid was crying.
As is movie law, the true bad guy here has to get in his last jab at the anti-hero before the climax, bringing up Duil's dead family. Can someone explain to me how activating the rage mode in your adversary is going to help you win a fight? Duil kicks him off the ship and leaps after him, slitting the captain's throat as they're falling. If only he'd done this about an hour ago with the Alpha when most of the crew were still alive. Of course, as we learned, he was working with the Alpha to force more of their immortal brethren out of hiding. If for some stupid reason we're not going to use a barrage of bullets to kill the Alpha, in these last few seconds we get the clearest picture of how we could have killed the Alpha much earlier and lived. No, we don't have the super strength to slit his throat like O, and we may or may not have known about his thermal vision. But he does have a tell, one that stood out within seconds of meeting him. That loud stomping and the power of his attacks suggest he's denser than a bimbo taking a calculus exam. After after machine gun fire, the second best way to get rid of him is to knock him from the ship into the ocean. The Philippine Sea is deep, like Lovecraftian deep, outdone only by the Mariana Trench. On average, the basin of the Philippine Sea is 6,000 meters or nearly 20,000 feet deep. His unnaturally dense body would sink faster than he could swim or hold on to the ship. It might require a human sacrifice, but taunting him into chasing us over the railing is pretty doable, and it could save everyone else's lives. As long as he did and grab you, the crew could reel you back into the ship. Luring a monster off a cliff doesn't exactly sound like plan A, but neither was the prison riot aided by heavily armed undercover crew. It's more like plan E. Paying attention to your prisoners and transporting the monster properly and closing all the engine room doors to seal in the escaped criminals and just eviscerating his head with gunfire were plans A through D. Now we're left with this. For all those reasons, I think the Alpha in Project wolf hunting was beaten. Next time you're transporting dangerous fugitives, call Nick Cage. Then reserve a private jet and airfield for the day and fly them the four hours it takes to go from Manila to Busan. Use 10 jets and transport them in pairs so they can't gang up on you. There's no rule saying you have to take them all at once like they're on the school field trip.